Hi, I'm Jason Robinson, host of Innovation and in Industry. From gold panning to the boardroom, we look at a number of heavy industries. The challenges faced, the strategies deployed, and the massive opportunity to positively affect communities, the planet, and the financial bottom line. So my name is Julie Gelfand. I'm the Vice President of Environment and Social Responsibility at uh, Iron Ore Company of Canada, which is uh, owned by Rio Tinto, approximately 60%, and we have two other shareholders. Previous to that, I spent most of my life as um, in the environmental movement. I was the president of Nature Canada, which is one of Canada's um, largest conservation organizations that represents about 350 nature clubs all across the country. Wow. And we have provincial clubs as well. So in British Columbia would be the BC Federation of Naturalists, which I think has changed its name to Nature BC. Mm. We used to be the Canadian Audubon Society. So a lot of people of a certain generation know the Audubon name, other people don't. Mm. So spent most of my life in the NGO and then went into uh, the mining sector. And, and what took you there? What, uh, did you see uh, uh, an opportunity there for yourself? And yeah, it was an opportunity to help. After years of working, sort of lobbying the government mm -hmm. to do better in terms of nature protection, there's also a place for people to be working with corporations to help them do better on their journey. Well, and this is why I'm so excited to be here at the second annual Sustainable Mining Conference here in Toronto, yes. where we have industry, we have um, a number of different organizations all working, and individuals, yes. all working to uh, make an industry more sustainable. Um, and creating win-win-wins all the way through, which is really, I think, the exciting, the, the collaborative, exciting uh, future is. that we have. And really, for mining companies to hire people like myself and several other people who have spent their careers in the NGO world, mm -hmm. and to bring us in, I mean, we think in such a different way right. than the mining engineers think in the company, right? And most of the mining companies, they're really good at getting minerals out of the ground. That's their job. So they're not necessarily that good at thinking about what society wants in terms of and, and societal expectations. They're not necessarily good at thinking about environmental impacts. So bringing new, new diverse thinking into mining companies is really brave, smart. Very progressive. Um, progressive. Yeah. It's a little tough on them. It's a little tough on us. Um, but it's the way of the future, in my mm -hmm. opinion. That's and a way to innovate, which is, uh, you know, which any, any business wants to do. You always want to stay ahead of the I curve mean, and, and bringing people like you in to add value to their organization. Absolutely. So, I mean, yeah. I joined Rio Tinto because of the biodiversity policy, and their work on biodiversity is A1. Mm -hmm. It's working with the best conservation groups um, uh, internationally, uh, the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, Flora and Fauna International, BirdLife International, these are all top scientific NGOs. Um, and it's great for the NGOs to be working with the corporate Absolutely. side as well to help. Yeah. And so when I read the biodiversity work that we're doing globally, it's incredibly impressive. And that's from somebody who spent her life working on protecting biodiversity, <laughs> right? So it's really, I'm very proud that, that Rio Tinto is doing that and want to help them continue to yeah. do that. Well, Mount Milligan's an interesting project because it's been on the books for more than 20 years. And so mm -hmm. that really gave us a great baseline of environmental data to look at in the project planning. And because it's a greenfield project, the project planning was actually undertaken from reclamation backwards. Um, so we've got a really good plan for closure. Um, okay. Also, I think that some of the key things that make Mount Milligan a bit different, it's a zero discharge facility. So Wh that What does that mean? It means that there's no water from the project discharged into local rivers or streams. It's recycled uh, through the tailing storage facility to be able to use it again in the plant. So oh surface wow. water is collected and then we recycle our process plant water. That sounds very beneficial. That's yeah. good. Yeah. Um, the project also has a really quite small footprint for an open pit project, so four kilometers by three kilometers. Okay. Um, we were able to do that by clustering infrastructure and by one other thing that's quite unique and that was eliminating the need for waste rock piles. So oh. in our case, we're able to use all the waste rock material to raise the height of the tailing storage facility over the life of mine. Okay, so it sounds like you're, you're already working on the, 
what would be termed reclamation in the short term. We always want to keep that as an end goal. And yeah. one of the other things that's been really helpful for us on the environment side is we employ three members of local First Nations as environmental monitors on the project. Oh, excellent. So two of those environmental monitors from come from the McLeod Lake Indian Band, um, which is just south of Mackenzie, and mm -hmm. one comes from the Nakasli First Nation, which is adjacent to the district of Fort St. James. Oh, very good. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the other things I think I caught from, uh, from perhaps it was from your talk, you were talking about um, uh, other uh, engagement tools that you have on your website mm -hmm. that, um, that help you to track your progress from, not from your perspective, but from the community's perspective at large. So how we're yeah. asking the community, how are we doing? Yeah. Maybe you can describe that a little bit for me. We have a variety of different feedback tools. So anybody who comes to site to do a tour or mm -hmm. comes out to a community information session or is a subscriber to one of our online monthly updates, we survey them on how we're doing. Um, right. And we ask ranking questions that try to measure um, how effectively we communicate, uh, how trusted are we in the communities, right. um, do we operate in an environmentally sound manner. Um, and these kinds of indicators, while they're somewhat um, qualitative as opposed to quantitative, they still give us really useful feedback. In 2012, we also did a community relations audit which was a very interesting tool. Uh, we hired a third party who interviewed a number of our key stakeholders in the key communities mm -hmm. um, and provided us with great feedback. And we have a community sustainability committee. It meets quarterly. Mm -hmm. And uh, they've provided us with really useful information on community interests and concerns around sustainability and then also mm -hmm. give us very direct face-to-face -face feedback. Jocelyn, can you tell me a little bit more about uh, some of the other highlights from a uh, risk management perspective? Mm -hmm. It's such a big topic and such an important issue. Um, mm. And I mentioned earlier in my career, I've worked on a lot of sort of um, issues management projects. So okay. one of the things that early on at Mount Milligan we looked at was how could we assess risk, not just from a financial, legal, and operational perspective, but also from the perspective of our social and political capital. So that we took a look at risk through the lens of reputation. Right. Um, and I think that's been a very useful tool for us. It's um, one of the other presenters this morning was talking about monetizing some of these non-technical issues, um, okay. which I think is interesting and challenging. Um, but I think it's key to identify those non-technical issues and make sure that you've got a process in place to monitor and track them, which would enable you to be much better to respond should the need arise. Right. There, I, I, I know that there was a, another uh, company here at the conference who's got some very good software that helps transparently and demonstrably show uh, and track what you're doing with uh, with respects to stakeholder engagement. Mm -hmm. So are you using software similar to that or? We, we don't have quite as sophisticated an approach. We have a stakeholder sort of uh, database tool that we use. But, you know, some of these more sophisticated stakeholder engagement mapping uh, software packages, I think have a lot of value because it becomes really difficult to both keep track of all your stakeholders and their interests and concerns. And what you don't want to mm -hmm. do is have an issues raised that somehow falls between the cracks. So a process that's robust in helping you track those interests and ensure that you close the loop, answering people's concerns, I think could be quite valuable. As I was presenting earlier at the conference, uh, the main issue to be able to get your social license to operate is to build trust. Mm -hmm. So what's critical to build trust with Aboriginal groups in Canada is to understand their history. If you don't understand the history of these people, it's going to be very difficult to engage. So the first thing that you do need to do is a proper socioeconomic baseline. You need to understand who are these people, mm -hmm. what's the demographic, what are the health problems, what are the social problems. Cultural heritage is critical for these communities. They have a very strong link to water, the land, uh, etc. So you need to understand if there are any uh, specific cultural cultural heritage site that they may have close by your site. Then you mm -hmm. need to make sure that you will not destroy it or mm -hmm. impact it. You know, respect it. A lot of respect. So that's why it's critical yeah. to have a very good socioeconomic baseline, so that after that you can engage with them, mm -hmm. making sure that you won't make any faux pas or you will not be insulting them. Right. Because you have a good understanding on who they are. <coughs> Sorry. Then after that, the main thing is that when this is established, you need to have a proper engagement strategy mm -hmm. with them. How do you communicate? When do you engage? It has to be established jointly. Mm -hmm. It's not us telling them, we will meet with you every Friday at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. 
is how do we create a win-win situation mm -hmm. for you and us? Right. So it's moving away from the philanthropic approach. Sustainability is to create a win-win situation for both parties. This is sustainable. Right. And then if you start investing in economic diversification, this is what we talk about, life after mine. It's that vision of the community so that when the mine will shut down, the whole community doesn't collapse. Right. So you start building, you put the, the founding blocks the founding blocks to start building your exit from the outset when you engage with the local communities of crafting that long-term vision mm -hmm. that that community would like to have. You know, the traditional model is that you have <coughs> the mining company in the center of the relationship mm -hmm. and they engage with each of the stakeholders individually. Mm -hmm. What we're proposing in the strategic shift is to have London Mining as a stakeholder around issues of common interests where mm -hmm. we all work together to find a solution, which is linked to our business and linked to the local communities. The key important factor of what you've identified here is the ability for that community to to self-generate those those outcomes of what, what what they're looking to achieve. So. Exactly, and you buy into what they want to achieve instead of you fixing the targets of what they want to achieve. Yeah, yeah. That's the way I see it. Anyway, Beautiful. that's my humble uh, com <laughs> my humble contribution to sustainability. So, give us a, a couple of um, uh, examples of things that you're really uh, really proud of. So, for example, on in some of the area, uh, as you know, environment also is critical for the local communities, sure. especially with Aboriginal people. Absolutely. So what we're trying to do right now, and as a commitment, it's just not to have the Environmental Protection Agency to come and monitor our operation, but is to create a community environmental monitoring committee that are coming, you show them how you monitor the environment, how you do it, mm. and you have them to report to the community. So when you do the reporting, it's not you. You have a third party that says this is how it's being done. Right. It's being done properly, etc. So this is one of the kind of thing that we're putting in place. I'm currently negotiating an IBA in Greenland, so we're the Greenlandic are very keen on protecting the environment. The other issue that they're very concerned about is uh, maximum socioeconomic benefit at the of local course. level. Yeah. So again, it's to create uh, what we call the economic maximization committee, where you engage with local providers, chamber of commerce, association, and then you discuss packages of work that could be supplied locally and what are the requirements again and then you monitor that you will commit to procure locally that much and then you report jointly together and if you haven't reached these target then you have to discuss why this has not been reached mm -hmm. because the tendering way the local co local provider have put a tender too high they did not meet some of the requirement regarding health and safety, for example. Mm -hmm. So you discuss, you open the dialogue. It's transparency. People have to understand why they win and why they don't win. Mm -hmm. And then you build the capacity. Right. And at the same time, every meetings with stakeholders should be documented. Mm -hmm. All complaints, we have a very robust, I would say, uh, complaint register. So mm -hmm. we report on the complaints. We report when they are resolved. If they're not being resolved, we have to explain why they're not being resolved. You mm -hmm. know? So mm -hmm. again, it's building that trust. If you're very transparent, you disclose the information about grievance from local communities, you build a trust. Well, the grievances are also an opportunity for you guys to improve what you're doing, improve your All deliverables. The time. So. All the time. So as I mentioned over the, uh, at the conference, Building a mine have needs to have a lot of rigor. Mm -hmm. Obtaining your social license to operate has to be as rigorous as building the mine. So you need to have system in place to be able to track what you do, what are your commitments, what are you going to be doing, and be able to document that and be able to report externally. Right. But the key thing is to always establish joint targets mm -hmm. with them. You commit jointly, they commit with you to achieve these things. So at the end, if you don't achieve these things, they are co-owners, so they have to explain why this was not achieved. Yeah. So the tendency in the mining sector is that we take everything on our shoulder, and then after that we're in a situation that we need to justify what we've done and why we haven't achieved this. So the strategy that I promote from a sustainability perspective is to always work with other partners that have similar interests as us, create that win-win situation, that if it's successful, we all win. Well, if teamwork, right? Exactly. Yeah. So it's the same thing when you work with local communities. And unfortunately, companies still have to they still have to mature to get to that place where they feel comfortable to disclose information and engage which takes time but when you have a proper you have proper trust then things will move faster and when there will be critics of your project you will have third parties that will pr will defend you sure and and I, and if you're doing a lot a lot of these uh, community consultation you've got the community buy in uh, to the project you're you're going to be often moving your project forward much quicker 
Correct. You're going to be reducing potential uh, um, delays. Uh, delays or averse uh, reaction to it. You're going to be reducing any potential liability perspective on the end, uh, potential penalties, et, et cetera. It just makes perfect sense. So. Yeah, but so unfortunately, some people still don't mm -hmm. understand that. So we still have a lot of work to do in the field of sustainability to convince a uh, leader within that sector that this is critical to their success. Right. And there's been many case studies right now. Uh, Golden Sack, uh, Goldman Sachs did a study in 2008 about the cost of projects between three to three to five billion dollars. Every week of delay of being implemented is twenty million dollar loss. No, yeah. So it's huge. So it's a matter of building the business case again. So that's why when I present, I always say I'm not a cost center. I'm an investment center. Mm. I protect value <laughs> and I create value <laughs> for the company and for the local community. Yeah, it's a concept good. of share value. Yeah, that's right. It's that's always right. a concept. You have to see, we are here, we want to work with you, we want to share value. Yeah, that's right. Very good. Well, we are a technology company, first and foremost. Um, and uh, I think through the technologies that we can provide to our customers in the mining and metals processing industry is very much highlighting the uh, the sort of incremental issues when it comes to sustainability, you know, efficient um, um, energy savings, very little emissions, um, dealing with water scarcity and, and dealing with very uh, low grade ores as well, which is a problem today. So we have technologies to tackle these uh, uh, challenges that our customers are having today. So that is sort of the starting point. And then when it comes to our own operations, I think um, our very mission as a company is the sustainable use of Earth's natural resources. And we really take pride in the mission and when it was introduced to our board of directors a couple of years ago, our CEO made the point that I think this is a mission we can live with for at least the next 50 years. <laughs> so we have a very long term perspective and, uh, and we're trying to help our customers uh, wherever they are in the world. Um, to deal with uh, with all the challenges that they face, but also the challenges that they face in their um, in their social license to operate. So not just the environmental and technical and technological issues, but also uh, the, the societies and the communities where they work in. Mm -hmm. So we try to build partnerships uh, also in, in in that front. Believe very much that uh, the uh, current economic turmoil which we're experiencing is one of the signs of a new wave of innovation building up which is very much uh, driven by the the need for sustainability in everything we do mm -hmm. and uh, and of course as a as a planet uh, we still want to develop we still want to use our mobile phones we still need to drive our cars we still need to have our light bulbs to uh, light up our, our houses of and course. we need metals and minerals for of that course, yeah. and if you want to keep that standard of living we need to have a lot of brilliant uh, engineers with green hearts uh, who can come up with uh, with ingenious technologies to solve that issue where we can yeah. sort of decouple the um, impacts of economic growth from the environmental impacts that that growth has uh, traditionally had. Right, right. So uh, can you give me a couple of specific examples? Oh, I'd love to. Um, Let's take like, for instance, copper smelting in China. And uh, there's a great awakening happening and mm -hmm. has happened in the, uh, in the past few years. Uh, in the past 10 years alone, uh, the uh, copper smelting capacity has threefolded in China. At the same time, the emissions have been reduced down to less than 50% within 10 years. And at the moment, 70% of Chinese copper smelting capacity is done with Autotech technologies. So you can imagine the magnitude of the impact that having the emissions and at the same time uh, threefold increase. capacity inc increase uh, yeah. during that time period. So there is a lot that can be done with, uh, with sustainable technologies. Yeah. Yeah. So and, and, it, and I think it's showing that you know, we can have business, we can do business and, we yeah. and, and expand business. And at the same time, reduce emissions and, and have a win-win impact, and, and that's the key, I think, for the future is to find those win-wins, those collaborative um, stories of uh, of success. Oh, absolutely! And if you're looking uh, from the global perspective, the developing countries at the moment, um, the traditional scenar scenario has been that when you are first uh, poor and clean as a country, 
uh, and then you start developing, it automatically means that the economic growth brings pollution and uh, environmental impacts. And there was actually a novelist um, on economics called Simon Kuznets, uh, some tens of years, some decades ago, uh, um, a Russian US uh, economist who came up with this uh, call, which is called Kuznets curve, uh, that there was a pattern. And then when you are really rich and dirty, you realize that you cannot go on and you need to try and do something about the environment. And then in the end, when the development has taken long enough, you are back in the uh, clean phase so that you can become clean and, and right. rich. And but what we're trying to do is... But this is not true anymore. And it's not true anymore, <laughs> exactly. And, and, uh, and we're, we're trying to say that you can build a tunnel through this curve through sustainable technologies where you can go directly from poor and clean to rich and clean and you don't have to go up the curve of becoming dirty in between. Right, right. And that's happening a lot in, in developing countries and Philippines in Asia in, in many African countries. So people have realized that this is uh, this is really the way forward and, and right. we don't have we can take this leapfrogging, you know, in, in that sense. Yeah, and what I'm seeing from a lot of the people that, that I'm uh, interviewing from uh, Asian countries is a very strong interest in adopting these uh, advanced technologies very early. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So there's a huge market for uh, for companies like, like ours to, um, to provide uh, solutions for, for our industry. It's great to be at an event like this to hear what everyone else is doing. Absolutely, isn't it though? Isn't it? And it seems like everyone really is saying the same kinds of things. I mean, yeah. there seems to be such a, an interesting shift in. Uh, it's almost a transition, you know, in thinking, mm -hmm. you know, where you know CSR has become uh, not only you know uh, an element of risk mitigation, but an element of competitive advantage, you mm -hmm. know, for a lot of companies and. You know, we're starting to hear some really interesting stories on how, you know, companies are using CSR to really sort of um, uh, get ahead of their competition. Absolutely. Well, creating the economic argument is is uh, key. One of the uh, phrases that I use all the time: if you're not saving or making more money by adopting the principles of sustainability, then you're really not doing it right. Right. Because it's you know part of the the whole concept is uh, the financial component, so you have to be able to make that financial argument. And one of the things that we talked about uh, earlier um, kind of addressed that because uh, we were talking about implementing some technology and how that had reduced uh, GHG emissions, but you'd also been able to increase capacity. Maybe you can give me a couple of uh, wind examples there of of how that's been implemented right. for you. I mean, th this is an interesting question because we're, we're always asked on questionnaires how much uh, capital do we put to environmental projects and it's always a difficult one to answer because mm -hmm. it's such an integrated uh, answer. You know, we, we, sure. we, you know, all of our capital is somehow connected and so, for example, we've just gone through um, uh, a mill capacity expansion at our Chelapech mine which has really increased our uh, production or processing capacity almost doubled okay. and uh, and you know at first first you know the so the old way of thinking would be that you would you know assess that on purely financial metrics but you know what's happened is that it's resulted in a 22 percent reduction in energy uh, intensity uh, energy use intensity and a 22 percent reduction in greenhouse gas emissions mm -hmm. and so all of these things are connected somehow and so uh, you can't only just look at financial metrics now in terms of product project evaluation you sure. really do have to you know, consider the, the sustainability metrics. And that's what we're trying to get a little bit cleverer around, mm -hmm. you know, assessing projects where, um, you know, we take into account, uh, you know, the sustainability metrics as well. Yeah, and, and I mean, the 22% in or decrease in, um, in energy costs has certainly got a, a, a price to it yeah. and a value. Right. Um, right. The the CO2 reductions, I'm sure, has got a value as well because if you're not, you know, depending on which jurisdiction you're in, if you're not having to offset those 
those um, there's there's a value to that as well. Right. But then of course there's the societal implications and you know getting right. to market quicker and everything else that, right. that, that right. helps when you have that community consultative process. Right. right. So but what we're trying to do at Dundee and it's a it's a still a work in progress. I mean we're we're battling with you know the types of models that we're going to use. But try we're, what we're trying to do is calculate our total business impact mm -hmm. uh, in a community or in a region and so uh, normally you would sort of look at your financial impact you know the jobs that you create the taxes that you pay um, and if you wanted to go a step further you could look at sort of the indirect jobs and the induced jobs which is not you know, is an old sort of old model of right. way of looking at things right. um, but you can go one step further and really start to look at um, the total socioeconomic impact of your existence um, and and that means also evaluating and measuring the social return on your community programs and also to be fair to try and attempt uh, and value the environmental impact so that mm -hmm. you have uh, an equation where you have you know positive financial and economic impacts both direct and indirect but you can deduct some measure of environmental impact so that you can somehow calculate your your business net, net impact and that that just helps conversation with stakeholders and mm -hmm. really that's in the end that's what it's all about it's about engaging with your stakeholders and partnering with your stakeholders and making sure that you optimize that uh, total net impact. Yeah, yeah. Well, it sounds like you guys are, are definitely have got a great plan and you're, you're implementing that plan. And uh, It's and a work in progress. Well, <laughs> it, as everything is. Uh, yeah, but you're, yeah. you're starting to reap some of those rewards and, and I think that that's the really encouraging thing that, um, right. that helps us to, to spur forward with more, more right. of these, these right. programs. Well, I think um, yeah, we're very excited and motivated by the possibility for change in, in the mining industry and other sectors as well, actually. But mining, I think, is one of the businesses that still has a, a very substantial footprint on the planet, both in its immediate operations and you know, the, uh, you know, the downstream effects. Um, we're keen to make a difference. Uh, we are an organization that's got some deep technical expertise. Um, we have also built some strategic advisory capabilities that uh, draw from business consulting and the combination of business and technical know-how has actually enabled us to advise clients both on strategic direction uh, of their business you know, in view of the sustainability opportunities but also to then deliver those opportunities and in you know in, in almost all cases the delivery means substantial change in those businesses uh, the change that has to be driven from you know leadership level it usually means you know a system you know, a whole system perspective change so we're talking about leadership culture processes um, behaviors down in the front line and uh, decision making up in the boardroom very significant change. I think one of the biggest areas of opportunity is around those decision makings and particularly the development of sustainable strategies for uh, the assets that the mining companies operate and particularly the new assets that they are you know, currently developing so ones that are in the project phase and even you know, earlier than that in the, uh, in the, uh, the pre-feasibility stage and you know, what we've learned working with a number of our, our clients is that there are huge opportunities for rethinking some of the more traditional approaches that have been you know, used over, over the years for mine planning, mine development. Uh, bringing some of that insight into the, uh, into the options and, and uh, asset strategy gives companies new possibilities and uh, and open you know, opens up actually insights into much deeper you know bigger value and I'm talking financial value um, I think there are you know there are tremendous opportunities missed in the very early stages of, uh, of these uh, operations and projects um, due to this you know, 
perhaps uh, less insightful thinking. Um, and uh, you know, we've been able to help organizations rethink the, uh, the trajectories of these, of these projects and, uh, uh, and set them on a more sustainable track that will meet the expectations of the communities uh, and the environment that they, they're going to be impacting, but actually deliver more value to the business and the business's shareholders in the process. Jonathan, can you give me an example of uh, you know, some of those um, opportunities? Uh, because I think you, you and I share the belief that there's a huge uh, missed opportunity there potentially, or there is a huge opportunity to um, to to embrace this. And you know, how would you, you know, if I don't know if we can put a figure on that, but for the for the mining industry, what are we talking about? I mean, we're talking about uh, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars. Well, it, the uh, the mining industry. Uh, does invest billions of dollars in capital projects to uh, set up uh, new mining operations. Um, the financial case behind those projects, the MPV behind those, is based on you know, all sorts of assumptions around the, you know, the, the capex during the project phase and the revenue streams that will come during the lifetime of, of the asset and in fact the, you know, the, uh, the costs that will be required to close down the asset at the end of this life cycle. But the MPVs are generally pretty healthy and that's why you know, the, the resource sector is, is still a, um, a flourishing uh, industry sector. Um, the research that we've done recently looked at 170 capital projects across the world, uh, capital projects that were all in the half a billion dollar plus bracket, so significant projects. Um, pro I think there were 12 different organizations, mining and oil and gas companies that were running the projects. And, and what we found was that about 45% of those projects had been delayed by issues that we, well we, what we call non-technical issues, but mm -hmm. at the root of that were sustainability challenges, sustainability issues linked into either the environmental footprint of the project or the social impact of the project or the interaction between those two things. The, those delays were typically greater delays than the delays that the project suffered from technical factors. So, so actually what we found was the sustainability challenges are really very significant and those delays impact the, the MPV of those, of those capital projects. One of the organizations that we worked with, and a case study that, uh, that I've been talking to folk about, showed that the, the NPV value erosion of the overall portfolio due to these non-technical challenges was in the region of 20% just over the last two years. Um, and that, I think, uh, is a, a very big value opportunity. Uh, it doesn't wipe out the, the value of the portfolio because the portfolios are still pretty valuable uh, assets, but it is a significant amount of shareholder value being, being lost and there is great opportunity to preserve that value and actually in some cases with, uh, with a little bit more visionary thinking there's an opportunity to perhaps even to, to build value around mm -hmm. this stuff. Well, and, and grow it. And grow yeah. that twenty percent might be exactly. 20, 25, 22, 21 even. Um, and when we're talking about uh, in the hundreds of millions or billions of billions. dollars, billions, yeah, it's uh, it's it's not uh, it's not something to be missed. So absolutely. I was asked to come and give a talk today about professional, uh, professional practice. The students really don't cover this kind of thing as part of their degree and yet uh, engineering and geoscience are, are fundamentally important to the Canadian economy and uh, Canadian society requires that uh, the folks who are working in it be registered professionally so that 
um, they can be accountable for the work that they do to the public trust. And so I was speaking about that. Uh, it's of particular importance to Canada because um, the bulk of the world's mining deals take place on the, Canadian, on the, the TSX and the TSX Venture Exchange. And a lot of that work is, a lot of that um, capital is kind of risk capital. It's, it, can, it can come in fast and it can leave fast and it's very risk averse. Um, you want to make sure you, have as, you give the investors as much confidence as you can in, uh, in the information that they're receiving from their companies. And part of the way to ensure that is to make uh, engineers and geologists personally responsible for the technical disclosure that comes out of those companies. It happens that Canada has the toughest regulations in the world with regard to that, which makes it relatively unusual. Australia, the UK, the US, they have similar ideas uh, to us, but we, we have the toughest in the world, but then we have the largest mining market in the world. The result is that um, we have the most buoyant industry, mining industry, financial industry in the world. Uh, and it means it creates a whole wealth of job opportunities for professionals uh, in the Canadian industry. And we attract professionals from around the world uh, who are attracted by that combination of uh, personal accountability, transparency of law and, uh, and financial opportunities.